All right. So it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the start of the final session of the 19th International Fibonacci Conference. Our second Lucas lecture is going to be Kate Stang from the University of Colorado Boulder, who will be talking to us about a visual tour of Fibonacci numbers and the eccentric cousins elliptic divisibility sequences. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's quite an honor to be here. It's, I mean, here virtually. It's, uh, I'm, I'm very sad that we weren't able to all get together in Sarajevo, but, um, but hopefully next year. So uh, today I want to talk about Fibonacci numbers and elliptic divisibility sequences. Elliptic divisibility sequences is something which um, I studied in my thesis work. Um, and they're very closely related. And so I'm going to sort of reintroduce the Fibonacci numbers um, in a certain geometric way, which then naturally generalizes. Um, and in the meanwhile, throughout the talk, I want to show lots of pictures. And at the end, it'll just devolve into showing many, many pictures because um, I've been um, working with undergrads to build a tool called NumberScope, which helps visualize integer sequences in various ways. And so I want to show you some of the pictures that I've made. Um, okay. So let's start with the Fibonacci numbers. Um, I think probably every single talk starts with Fibonacci numbers, <laughs> so they don't need much introduction. But, uh, but I want to focus for the moment on this, um, this curious fact that if n divides n, then the nth Fibonacci number divides the mth Fibonacci number. And I'm sure everybody has their favorite explanation for this fact. Um, uh, we've got the example on the side. If you wanted to discover this fact, um, you might factorize all the, the various Fibonacci numbers and see um, some of these coincidences. So um, I'm hoping you can see my mouse perhaps on the screen. So um, the fifth uh, Fibonacci number is, is five and then the tenth. Okay, so, um, so, the, um, so this isn't a great way to see the divisibility. So um, I wanna show you a different way of seeing the divisibility happening. So I want you to consider an array. These are gonna be pixels on the screen eventually. So um, think of at the top, we're going to label all the columns by the sequence itself, the terms of the sequence. So that's for, for it could be any sequence. It doesn't need to be the Fibonacci number. So this could be A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. And then um, what I'm gonna do is put underneath that, the sequence shifted over by one and then shifted over by two and so on in each successive row. So, um, so I want you to have this in mind. Each row is just a shifted version of the sequence itself. Now I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger here and highlight uh, a few things to observe. So for example, now if you wanna compare the sequence, the original sequence, which is in red across the top, to um, the, every second term of the sequence, so the sequence of even indexed terms, then you could look at this main diagonal in blue on the screen right here. Um, so that comparing the top of any column with the blue, um, uh, term in that column compares a term with the term at um, the position doubled. And you could do the same with um, multiplying all the indices by three, for example. So this green line, which might be very pale on your screen here, um, would compare the original sequence to every third term. Okay, so what I'm going to do with this array of pixels is I'm going to, at this pixel here, which is highlighted in blue, say A5, I'm going to compare it with the column header and color accordingly. So this A3 up here compared with A5, I'm gonna color it by their GCD, okay? So that'll pick up when terms have um, common um, factors. And if there's, common fact if there's a pattern of common factors in the vein of divisibility, then you'll see it as these diagonal lines. So let's see a picture. This is the integers. So right on here, you've got this main diagonal. So every integer divides um, twice itself. And this is every integer dividing three times itself. Um, this is sort of two thirds, and you've got all of the rational slopes appearing. And this picture might look familiar. So um, on the internet, you might find pictures of when two integers are co-prime. And if you look at where there's dots and where there's not dots in a box in here, that'll look a lot like those pictures. And then I've just um, made very dark the ones where there's a big common factor. So it's kind of the inverse of um, a picture you might find, for example, on Wikipedia. So, um, so this is, uh, I think it's a very pretty um, picture of the divisibility property in the integers. And so if we do this with the Fibonacci numbers, we get pretty much the same picture. And that tells us that the um, Fibonacci numbers have this divisibility property. 
and so in the talk today, I'm going to talk about elliptic divisibility sequences. So I'll show you an elliptic divisibility sequence. It's a little paler somehow. The, the terms grow very, very fast in an elliptic divisibility sequence. Um, so there's sort of um, the, the um, common factor isn't as big compared to the term, and so it isn't colored as dark, but you see the same pattern. Okay. Okay, so now let me go back to uh, how I like to think about the Fibonacci numbers. So um, I'm going to draw this curve. So uh, its equation is down at the bottom here, and I've drawn it um, in the real Cartesian plane in blue. And I've marked a few points on there. Um, and so those are the, you know, well, I've got my mouse here, so we've got zero, zero, two thirds, two thirds, et cetera. And then I have a map from this curve to uh, non-zero reals which takes the uh, coordinates x and y to this ratio here. And um, so whatever the image is of 2 thirds, 2 thirds, I've called it phi. It's not actually the golden ratio. Um, so apologies for using that. And, uh, and this one, for example, goes to alpha. Um, and here's a few other examples on this curve. OK, so this is the, I've just set this up. I've got this curve. It has various points on it. And I have a map so that each of these points can be interpreted as a real number. Now, um, what's amazing about this the setup, what's special about this setup is that um, if I have three points which are on a line, so here I have an example on a yellow line, then um, that happens if and only if the things that they map to under my special map multiply to one. So here I've got alpha phi and one over alpha phi. And this is just, this is a true fact for, the, for any points that you might pick. And so what this means is that the group law, I mean, it's a funny way of writing the group law. I'm, I'm, I'm writing down the collection of facts um, which is any three things which multiply to one. But basically it says that the multiplication in the reals has a geometric interpretation on the curve. So you can turn this into an operation in which you combine two things to get a third, if you like, and I'll do that in a second. But um, basically what I'm going to be showing you, the, the moral of the story here is that this is going to be an isomorphism of groups. So on the one hand, you have a curve together with all the points on the curve and some sort of geometric rule for combining them. And on the other hand, you have the real numbers uh, with multiplication. So if I add an extra line in here, then, um, then we've got a, a, a geometric description of how to uh, combine two points under the group law. So let's take phi and alpha. So this point and this point. I draw the line through those to get a third point up here. And then I draw this green line through that and zero, zero, which maps to one of my maps. So it's the identity of so, so then drawing this green line through the point that I got, the green line, a third line, a third intersection point down here. And that is the result. If I had alpha and I had phi, then multiplying the two, this one becomes alpha phi. So, um, so this relies on the fact that this is a cubic equation right here, so that if I try to intersect a line with it, you will always get three points, so this construction will work. Um, this is the identity here, and, uh, and yeah, so now I've just given you a group law and a way to, to do it on this curve. Okay, so, um, so this curve is a very weird model of the multiplication in real numbers. Now, if I take phi to be this, um, this isn't exactly the golden ratio, but um, three minus root five over two. Um, then if I look at its powers, we get, um, we get some other expression in terms of root five. And you can pull out those coefficients. And it turns out that by choosing this starting point, since what I've done is essentially squared the golden ratio, um, the UNs, which appear when I take powers, will be the even indexed Fibonacci numbers. Now, I'd like to have shown this to you for the Fibonacci numbers, but there's an extra wrinkle in that case, which seemed like um, too much of a pain. So we're going to do it with the even ones. It's not, uh, it's just a technicality. Um, and so you can, morally speaking, we can do this for the Fibonacci numbers. But for exposition, I'm taking the even indexed Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so um, if I take that, then it turns out that is this fee that I've got right here. Okay, it goes, it comes from two thirds, two thirds. And so now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to write down uh, coordinates xn and yn given in terms of these coefficients un and vn. And it turns out then that that is the corresponding point on the curve. So this is the map between powers of phi and points on my curve. So, um, so that is what we're going to see then is that the Fibonacci numbers are appearing in the coordinates of the points right here. So let's actually, let's just uh, sort of scrunch some of what I just set up on the screen to make some room. 
So here's some examples here. So here's the first few even indexed Fibonacci numbers. And here are the corresponding points on the curve. And you can see the Fibonacci numbers appearing in the coordinates. OK, so this is kind of nice because over in the real side, you've got this root 5, right? You're not um, dealing with rational numbers. Um, but over on this side, all of these points are rationals. In fact, if you've got two rationals um, and you take the line through them, it's rational. You intersect it with this uh, equation here, which has a rational coefficient. So this point is rational and so on and so forth. And so if you start with this rational point here, all of um, when you add it to itself many, many times on the curve, you end up with um, more rational points. So over here, everything's rational, and you see the Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so this is, the, this is how I want to think of the Fibonacci numbers appearing. What they are is sort of a shadow of a group law on this curve. Okay. So now uh, what you can do is you can think of these things mod p. And what we're working towards here is an explanation for the divisibility property in the Fibonacci's um, in terms of this geometry. So what we've got on this side over here is my curve. And then I can just think of it mod 17, for example, which is, which is here. Um, so think about this. I've got this, uh, this curve. Sorry, I've repeated it, CC. <laughs> um, the, I've got this curve. It has some coefficients, which are co-prime to 17. So I can take 5 quarters mod 17 and write it as 3. So this gives a curve mod 17, just taking the coefficients mod 17. And the points are also, um, I can just take them mod 17. And uh, for the most part, it'll work. So 0, 0 goes to 0, 0. And then, for example, this guy would be 217, 215, sorry. And you'll find that point on the curve. So 215 would be right here. Um, and so these, there's a map, reduction mod p, from this whole picture to this picture, if at least we restrict our attention to those rational points. But what we were interested in for the Fibonacci numbers was just the rational points anyhow. So, um, so the rational points over here map to fp or mod p points um, on what I'll call c twiddle just or c tilde just to, um, to indicate that we're working mod p. Okay, so this is just something you could do. And of course, um, if you could do something like this, you, you should do it and see what you learn from it. So um, the important uh, point is that you can detect when something is the identity. Now over here, nothing's the identity except the identity right, zero, zero. But over here, lots of the rational points which were not the identity become the identity when you reduce mod p simply because um, there's only finite many things for them to go to. So how can you detect that? Well, if you go back and look at the coordinates that we had, the Fibonacci numbers were appearing in the numerators. So if you're going to go to zero, zero, that means that your numerator um, became zero when you reduced mod p. So what this means is that when a prime p, like 17 in this case, divides the Fibonacci number, that signals, that tells you that the order of the corresponding point on the curve, when you reduce that mod p, when you look at the um, image of that group as a new group mod p, um, that has the, the order of that point is the index that you're sitting at. Okay, so what this means is that p will divide the zero term, and then it'll divide every nth term um, for some n, and n is the order of the point in the reduced group. So what happens is that it appears at some sort of regular uh, intervals, and so if p divides the nth term, then it has to divide the 2 nth term and the 3 nth term and so on. So this explains a lot of the divisibility. It doesn't quite explain all of it because it doesn't explain prime powers, but you can do that too. So I'm just going to, to stop here where I think the, um, the story is uh, particularly nice. Okay, so, um, so this is the way I like to think about the Fibonacci numbers, and the reason is because then you can uh, generalize this and you can ask what other curves have a group law. So it turns out that um, elliptic curves do, and the curve I was showing you was a sort of singular case of an equation that, one, that in, in general would be called an elliptic curve. So um, you can write elliptic curves um, for the most part as y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. So they're cubic curves. And, um, and if you're not in these special cases, like the one that I just showed you, then you, get, you still get a group. You still have the same group law with lines to do the group law. Um, the, in this form that I've written it here, your identity point is out at infinity, which is some sort of confusing complication. But you could just change coordinates to make it nice the way I did on the previous screens. Um, so you get a group. And it's not the multiplicative group of some field. It's, um, it's something new. 
And, uh, and so you can do the same thing that we did before and the coordinates will spit out um, something called an elliptic divisibility sequence. And so I've given an example on the screen here. And it turns out that again, it's a recurrence relation, but it's not such a simple recurrence as the Fibonacci numbers. It's um, what you see on the screen here. So uh, you'll always have that this sequence satisfies this recurrence relation and you need four initial terms to get started with this recurrence relation if you take a look at, um, uh, start messing around with it. So, um, so it's, that's why I call it the eccentric cousins of the Fibonacci numbers. Um, there's a lot more complication going on. You get one for every different choice of elliptic curve. There's, there's infinitely many such things. Um, and you have this more complicated recurrence relation, but because they are both in this way shadows of a group, you can expect the, um, the, the sorts of behaviors that they exhibit to be similar. And so it, it's, a, um, it's something that people do, which is to take a look at Fibonacci numbers, see all the wonderful things that are proven about Fibonacci numbers, and ask for analogs for elliptic divisibility sequences. How do we generalize to this larger class of things? And many of the things do have analogs, um, and I'll mention a few of them as we go forward. Um, okay, and so this, um, this way of setting up elliptic curves and the sequences together, it's actually a very tight bijection. So on the one hand, you have elliptic curves, you have a pair of an elliptic curve and a choice of point, because remember we needed that starting point. And we're going to look at the multiples of that starting point to get the Fibonacci numbers. Well, if you pick any um, rational point on a, an elliptic curve with rational coefficients, um, you can get an elliptic divisibility sequence out of it. And conversely, if you have an integer elliptic divisibility sequence, meaning that it satisfies the recurrence relation, you can actually reverse engineer what the curve and the point had to be. And um, that's actually what I did to get the previous slides, is I just reverse engineered from the Fibonacci numbers. Um, you have to be careful. There's a lot of details to, to this, right? Elliptic curves can have many different models that are isomorphic, um, and those might give certain scalings, uh, sort of unimportant scalings to the, to the sequence. Um, and then you've got these singular cases. If you want to include the singular elliptic curves, um, then you get the linear recurrences, and in fact, you get the case of the integers. And uh, it's also possible to generalize this to higher dimension. This is actually what I did in my thesis work. Um, so you could take a curve um, and take a look at two points on that curve, and then you would get an array instead of a sequence, right? a whole grid full of integers. Um, and the philosophy here is that this bijection gives you uh, a different way of describing all the same arithmetic of elliptic curves, um, often less accessible way, but occasionally more accessible way. Um, so the group law that you have on the curve, the geometry there, is actually just the recurrence relation. Those are the same thing, because if you have something satisfying the recurrence relation, then there's a curve hidden in the background. All right. So that's um, elliptic divisibility sequences. Okay, so these are the pictures that I showed you before. Um, so I'm going back to the, um, the, the visualizer here. So these are the integers. This is the Fibonacci's and this is the elliptic divisibility sequence. Let's play with a few other sequences. Um, another thing you can do with the visualizer is instead of coloring the dots by the GCD, so how much of a common factor the two um, terms that you're comparing have, you could color by the how far apart they are just in, in actual distance as integers. So if you do that with the integers, you see this and it just gradually fades because remember the top line is the integers themselves. The second line is the integers all shifted over by one, so the distances will all be one, and then the next line, the distances will all be two compared to the, the original line. Um, and so this just gradually fades to black. If you take the integers mod 38, it'll actually come back in. You'll see it again, so you get these repeating bars. Um, and that's actually kind of useful because then um, this is giving you a little bit of a sense of the growth of the integers. How fast are they growing, right? If they were, if they were exponential or something, instead of growing linearly, these bars would be like spaced out or something, right? So let's see what happens. Here's the primes, um, mod 38. So you see bars again, but they're all twisty because the primes are somewhat irregular. Um, your eye also picks up these fractures that happen along anti-diagonals, and those come from sort of larger prime gaps that appear and make a bigger disruption to the picture. Um, so that's uh, primes mod 38. Here's squares mod 48. So, um, so now you see this is what quadraticness looks like mod 48, uh, or if the pattern is very similar um, modulo, you know, for whatever modulus. Here's um, Hofstadter's figure figure sequence. Um, if you're not familiar, the sequence is defined in this goofy way where you, um, you take the different, the, 
successive differences of the sequence is equal to its complement or something like this. Um, and this forces, uh, determines the sequence. And just taking a look at it, um, mod 48, uh, you realize, oh, look at that, it grows quadratically. So you can see the growth rate um, is quadratic from this picture, which I think is kind of cool. Here's the Fibonacci's mod, uh, 432 in this case. And so what you pick up immediately is that it's periodic. This is a repeating pattern. Um, and, uh, and of course the Fibonacci's are periodic modulo, any particular modulus. Um, and because the beginning of the sequence grows a little slower and then later on it gets crazy, you see these sort of patches, these diamonds that you're seeing on the screen here um, of terms that are close to one another, even modulo big modulus. Um, and these are also effect, uh, um, side effects of that. Um, and then things get less predictable. So, and here's an elliptic divisibility sequence. So again, uh, very similar. So it's, it's going to be periodic. Um, and again, it's periodic modulo sum modulus for the reason that the group, um, the underlying group mod any particular prime is finite. Um, so for example, if your modulus is prime, those zeros are gonna repeat at regular intervals. And in fact, the, the whole sequence will repeat at regular intervals, just um, the, the, the periodicity may be a multiple of the order of the points. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, okay. So, uh, so yeah, so as I was just saying, they're both periodic. Um, you can see that the, the simplest way to see that, of course, is from the recurrence relation. Um, you only, you can use, even with the uh, elliptic divisibility sequence recurrence relation, you can see that it only depends on um, finitely many of the, uh, or it's sort of a near neighborhood of the previous terms. And so um, by pigeonhole principle, you eventually repeat and then you're stuck repeating. Um, the, if you take a look at the period of the Fibonacci numbers mod n, it's called the Pisano period. The multiplicative group, so let's, let's think about um, uh, mod p for p of prime, the multiplicative group over fp squared. And remember, we have to work over fp squared because we had that root 5, oh, when, not when we're on the curve side, but when we were in the reals. So when we reduce mod p, we're now related to um, multiplicative group over a finite field fp, but we have a root 5, and so it might actually be fp squared. Um, so that has p squared minus 1 elements, and so the order of the point has to divide that because it lives in that group, that isomorphism of groups that we had over the reals and the, the, the curvy picture, the curve actually works over mod p. And so we get um, that the, the order of the point has to divide p squared minus one. And then the period, Pisano period is actually some multiple of that because the intervening terms between the regularly appearing zeros um, uh, don't have to repeat right away, but they, but they end up repeating eventually. And what's interesting is on the elliptic divisibility sequence side, this, um, this extra wrinkle about that the actual period of the sequence is a multiple of the order of the point, uh, that's actually carrying the information of the ve or tape pairing on the elliptic curve, um, which is used in cryptography. And that's, again, um, something that, um, that I figured out in my thesis, um, which is fun. OK, so that's a little bit about periodicity. Um, so here's Pisano periods. And they, in fact, have a kind of divisibility property as well. So you do see it in this picture, but it's a lot busier picture, a lot messier. And the reason for that is really that the Pisano periods, um, they tend to be very composite. And so they just share a lot of factors that are kind of unexpected and it, it swamps the signal to some extent. Um, but you can still see that they have a divisibility property. Um, another of the big uh, um, things that people have considered for both Fibonacci numbers and elliptic divisibility sequences is um, what's called primitive divisors. So um, if you have a prime divisor, it appears somewhere in the sequence. And the first time it appears, you call it a primitive divisor because it's, uh, it has not appeared in the sequence before. It's new at that term. And, um, and it turns out that um, what's true for the Fibonacci numbers is that once you get past the 12th term, um, every single term will have at least one primitive prime divisor. So there's going to be some new prime that appears there. And in fact, for any Lucas or Lamer sequence, um, this holds once you get past 30. Um, so this motivated people to think about elliptic divisibility sequences and ask if they behave the same way. Um, and so you'd expect that they, they might. And the set of terms uh, with no primitive prime divisor is finite in that case. We just, um, it's not effective. We can't say um, some bound past which it'll always happen, but we know that it's finite. And it's different for every elliptic curve, right? There's, there's very many of these. Okay, so um, if you take the primitive part of the Fibonacci number, so by that it's sort of related to this idea of a primitive um, divisor, I'm going to take the part which is not dictated by the divisibility property, so it doesn't, doesn't have to come from the previous 
it isn't dictated by your knowledge of the previous uh, terms which are going to divide it. So if you just take that part, you could draw some of these same pictures. And this one is just the distance of the primitive part of Fibonacci numbers. And of course, they're big and they're um, just, well, okay, they're big. <laughs> so they're probably not going to be the same very often, right? So you're going to see uh, mostly just a black screen when you do this. But it turns out that when you draw it, there's this tantalizing blue and yellow sequence going down the screen right here. And, um, and I don't know exactly why this might, true, might be true, but I expect there's a good reason for it. So what you observe is the following, that, um, that if you take the 2 to the n minus 2 term and the 2 to the n plus 2 to the n minus 1 minus 2 terms, <laughs> the primitive part of one is one more than the primitive part of the other. Um, so that's what the picture conjectures. Um, and, uh, and I, I bet there's a good, good reason for this, um, but, uh, but I don't, I don't happen to know what it is. All right. Um, this is a, a picture. So what I did preparing this talk, right, is I started playing around with sequences related to Fibonacci numbers and just throwing them through my various visualizers, um, and looking for cool stuff. And I loved this picture. This is a very patternful looking picture. This is the sequence. Um, the nth term is the number of representations of N as a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. Um, and this is the divisibility picture, so the GCD picture. And you do see those lines again. So there's, um, there's something happening um, relating, for example, the number of representations of n to the number of representations of 2 times n. But there's a lot more happening, too. It looks like there's these diamonds which are growing um, at some regular rate and seem to be kind of self-similar. Um, you might wonder, OK, uh, how much of this is um, from the sequence? How much of it is just from, say, the growth rate of the sequence alone and the, um, the properties of the visualizer? Because the visualizer itself tends to produce uh, some patternful looking stuff even on ran random data. So I programmed in a way to just jiggle the sequence so you can randomly adjust each term by plus or minus one, which should destroy the divisibility, but it will preserve the growth rate. So if you do that, you get this. So this is sort of a picture of, at that growth rate, what the visualizer itself will produce. And it does look patternful. You do see lines, especially anti-diagonal and vertical lines. Those are sort of a, um, a result of the, the visualizer itself, because you do end up comparing um, uh, a term to another term more than once and stuff. And so you see some repetition in the picture. But the actual picture uh, definitely looks like there's, there's a lot of interesting structure there. So I think um, you can use a picture like this to make some conjectures. Um, here is, oh, look at that. Uh, I forgot. Yeah, that line is not a, a slope of two. Right, I forgot. So uh, I, I was finding this very, very fun last night. Um, so the number of representations of um, n as a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers. Now I'm doing it with um, just the distance between them, but I'm just highlighting when they're equal and leaving it dark when they're not. And you get these lines, but it turns out these lines are not actually at slope two and three. These lines are at some other irrational slope. If you look carefully at it, this are kind of clustering around, but the pattern doesn't exactly repeat. It gets messed up a little bit. So I think this is an irrational slope of about 1.64, not 1.61. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then you see this one, and then you see these other lines coming in, and these I really don't know. They're not even parallel to one another, um, but they're definitely there. And so this is a, this is a fascinating picture. So, um, so somehow it looks in the picture, it seems like the picture is conjecturing the following, that the number of representations is a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers coincides for integers whose ratio is close to 1.63 1.64 or 2.70, just based on um, collecting some data points from the picture. And I have no idea uh, for the explanation for that. So hopefully somebody in the audience um, has some interesting ideas. So, um, so all of this comes out of the experimental math lab at CU Boulder. So this um, number scope visualizer, I've just shown you one of the visualizers. It's supposed to be a whole package of visualizers. Um, it's part of a project that I started at the experimental math lab at CU Boulder. The math lab is part of a, um, a sort of movement of geometry labs under an umbrella organization called Geometry Labs United, which is just a loose um, uh, collection so that lab directors can get to get to working together. The philosophy is a little wider in scope than an REU. So um, it's research, but with a focus on experimentation, computation, visualization, 
and with an emphasis on an outreach and even um, pedagogy component as well. And so students are um, students are involved. Who it's it's not just focused on students who are heading to graduate school, for example, but um, everybody who's going to go on to be a lover and ambassador of mathematics um, and ways for lots of people to get involved doing lots of different things. Um, and so here's one of the groups that uh, that we had at the lab. They were doing some 3D printing here. This is a um, that's a Weierstrass function on a torus or something. So um, uh, for number scope, which is just one project uh, uh, under the math lab at CU Boulder, um, these are some of the students and um, uh, people who have been involved. And the idea is to be able to uh, play with the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, which you all know and love. Um, you may know the OAIS movie, which is wonderful. You can see graphs of all these sequences and you see so many patterns and so many interesting things happening when you watch this movie. It's just like slide after slide of graphs of sequences. Um, and the idea is to, to embrace that sort of approach. So to create other visualizers. So we want an online tool, which would be a website where you can like take an OEIS number, go to a website, just plug it in. It will talk to the OEIS, pull out the terms. You pick, click on one of the visualization tools, um, throw it in and play with it. Um, it should be very accessible for a wide audience and it should be, you know, can be supported by the community so that you can add your own visualizers. Um, you can uh, you know, share the parameters and things that you've played with and, and so on. So we're working towards this. It's not launched yet, but, um, but we have some visualizers to play with. And uh, what kinds of things might you visualize? I mean, a graph is a classic tool. Um, you learn a lot from using graphs, uh, but there's lots of other things that you can do too, right? Um, so a graph might show you the growth rate, but it might not show you the visibility properties. And we just saw something that does pick that up. Uh, Self-similarity, the fractal nature of, of sequences, substring statistics, um, what happens mod p, mod n. So I'm going to show you a couple of the other visualizers, um, show you lots of pictures here. And we'll just see how far we get through the pictures because I realize uh, that um, we don't have that much time left. Okay, so um, you could do a turtle uh, visualizer. So if your sequence, say, say we have a sequence of zeros and ones, you could interpret zero as a behavior for the turtle. So turn some number of degrees and take however many steps. And so um, if I sequence was zero, I would first turn, uh, take 90 degrees and then take one step. And then at one, I would turn 270 degrees and take two steps and then 90 degrees and take one step 90, and so on. So if you do this, um, here's some of the cool pictures that you get. Uh, so we've got Hofstadter figure figure, she definitely has some sort of behavior in regions. So for a while, we'll do one thing, then we'll do something else. Um, the two attic valuation of the integers produces these beautiful pictures. They're just gorgeous um, because of its sort of fractal nature. This is the number of divisors of n, and you can see that it also has a sort of behavior. It does something for a while and then breaks the pattern and does it again. But the, the periods in which it's doing that particular thing are uh, lengthening so that this changes over time. It starts up at the top here and changes as you go. Um, the Tui Morse sequence gives you the, the famous snowflake. Fibonacci's mod 4, uh, of course, that's periodic, so you get these periodic pictures. Here's an elliptic divisibility sequence. This is the prime location, so you have a 1 if you're at a prime position, prime index, and a 0 otherwise. This also has this sort of behavior that I was talking about a few slides ago. I find, that, I find this one particularly appealing. This is the Pisano periods under the exact same rule as the previous slide. Um, the ternary Tribonacci word pr produces beautiful pictures. And here's the number of representations as a sum of Fibonacci numbers, but this is mod two. And I think that has something in common with, um, with this guy and with the n-adic valuation. Um, it's kind of interesting. All right, so let me show you another visualizer. Uh, this is the what, what I call the prime filter. It's sort of a... a histogram on, on steroids. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare primes and sequences. So each um, uh, position in the table is, uh, its column is indicated by a prime. So I'm looking at the statistics mod uh, five, or with regards to the prime five, I should really say. Um, and then the, the rows are different sequences. So I'm going to take the sequence, but then I'm going to take all of the terms with a minus one on each term or a minus two on each term. Okay, so I'm going to compare all shifts of the sequence in that sense. Okay, and uh, and so right here, I'm just going to make that darker, a darker color if five divides a lot of the terms. So I can collect data up to some point in the sequence and just count how often five divided it. And if five squared divided it, count that twice. 
And this is the kind of picture that you get. So this is the Fibonacci numbers. And what we've got here, this row here is the Fibonacci's themselves. And you'll see these sort of darker stripes across here. And so that means that the Fibonacci number is plus eight. If I add eight to every term, tends to be divisible by small primes more than if I add nine. So you see patterns, uh, overall patterns, and in the live version, you can mouse over and get some histograms describing exactly what's happening. There's some pie charts, sorry. Um, so, uh, so I suspect people in the audience might be able to come up with reasons for this. The Fibonacci numbers themselves should be somewhat highly divisible because they're divisibility sequence. They have to have various factors um, from earlier terms appearing over and over again. Um, but, uh, but also when you translate by one, two, three, maybe five, eight, hint, hint, yeah. Anyway, and then, uh, and this one um, I quite enjoyed. So this is the primitive part of the Fibonacci's. And take a look at this, the, you, as you expect, the primitive part here is not divisible by a lot of small primes because those are already used up. They can't be in the primitive part. They appeared earlier on, on in the sequence. So that doesn't happen very much. But if you subtract one from the primitive part, they're highly divisible by small primes. Um, and I didn't immediately see an explanation for this, um, but I asked Joe Silverman and he pointed out um, the beginnings of an explanation for this, which again, ref you know, it can, is in terms of the, uh, the underlying group. Um, but, uh, but I think in the interest of time, I'll just show you a few more pictures. So that's one question. Does the primitive part minus one tend to be smooth? Uh, just for fun, this is the Ramanujan tau function, which produces this, this startling picture in the prime filter. Um, if you're familiar with that function, you'll appreciate that. Um, and here's a, a BD sequence. Um, this one's fascinating in real time because you can watch it grow as the statistics accumulate as you add more terms and these bars fade and appear and fade and it has to do with the continued fraction. Okay, one more cool picture before we end. Um, so this is what uh, is called the chaos game. And so this has been around for a long time, the chaos game, and I'm just going to um, uh, use it to, to build a sequence, uh, which is already, um, which has also been done for DNA sequences. Um, this is a way of visualizing DNA sequences. So, uh, so start at the origin. So I've got my dot at the origin right here. And you use your sequence to guide steps. So at each term, your sequences, you should take a bond four or something so that you have four possible terms in your sequence. So the sequence is a sequence of one, two, three, and threes and fours. And if my first is a two, I'm going to walk towards two, but I'm only going to get halfway there. So I've gotten to here and I put a dot. Then I take my next term and I walk from where I was halfway to the corresponding corner and I put a dot. And then halfway from that dot where I am now to the corresponding corner for the next term and then halfway again because I had the same corner again. And I leave behind a sequence of dots. So this seems like a crazy thing to do. Here's what you do if you have a random, what you get if you have a random sequence mod four. So you just get something uniform in the square. So certainly you can detect some types of non randomness um, doing this. But if you do a random sequence mod three and put it in a triangle, you get a Sierpinski gasket. So the difference here is that with a square, a square is exactly four copies of itself in smaller, but a triangle is not um, exactly three copies of itself in smaller. It has a gap in the middle when you do that. And so you end up um, with some structure just coming from the, the behavior, from the design of the game itself. And that's why it was called the chaos game. Here's a square but with primes. And what I'm doing is the prime, I'm taking uh, mod 10 and looking at the last digit, which is um, one, three, seven, or nine. So those are the four corners of my square. And it's not random. And this tells you that there's a, um, a short term um, correlation. So if you have a one, you're less likely to have a one again as the next prime, for example. And um, this was done for DNA, these visualizations to detect short-term correlations. And then somebody did it on the prime numbers and they saw this and they're like, wow, cool. And then people went and um, came up with explanations for it. So, uh, so it's a great way to discover some interesting things. So I'll just finish with a couple pictures from this. So we have here the number of divisors of N and I've done um, actually several pictures on one here. So this is for N congruent to one mod six, two mod six, three mod six in different colors and you see very different behaviors. So did, there's definitely interesting things going on there. And here is the fundamental period of Fibonacci numbers. And so what this picture tells you, since it's not um, uniform across the square, is that there is some short-term correlation. So for example, um, successive fundamental periods mod four should have some sort of uh, short-term correlation. Um, you know. So I think I'll just end with that. So if you wanna play around, you can play with the number scope on my website. 
um, if you're interested in being a beta test when we launch the proper website. And if you have a favorite integer sequence, just go ahead and email me. And thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. We have time for a few quick questions. And I've put links to uh, these items in the chat, or I will be putting in the chat in a moment as soon as my computer loads. In. So I have a quick outreach question. Have you gone to elementary schools you know, back in the days when we could physically go into buildings? <laughs> um, no, so our lab has just started. We've only been around for a few years, um, but that is a big component of what a lot of the labs do. And so hopefully we'll be able to get uh, some enthusiasm um, and energy going to do some of those things in the future once we, like you said, can be back in the physical rooms with people. Yeah, I've done that in the past. I actually did it remotely this past spring. Oh, wow. it, it worked, didn't work as well as physically being there. We, we played the you know, rectangle spiral game and the students independently discover the relationships. Oh, great. And then I had one other question. When you were showing a lot of these relationships and the plots, have you tried varying the parameters of say the recurrence relation in one of these things to see how the picture changes as you change the recurrence? Oh, that's a great idea. So you mean just varying the coefficients? Varying the coefficients are even more sharply changing, you know, the gaps between, you know, does it go, you know, an plus one is an, or an plus one is an minus one, you know, something more uh -huh. severe. It would be interesting. Oh, yeah. No, that's a great idea because recurrence relations are a pretty fundamental collection of sequences. And that's something that would be easy to build into the member scope because what we're doing is we're, um, we're trying to, um, make it really easy for the user to experiment in ways like that. So we're going to put filters over the sequences. So you can put in your favorite sequence and then you can adjust it in various ways. You could take the successive differences or look at it under various different sorts of filters. And with the um, recurrent sequences, which we will probably build in natively just because they're so fundamental, you could also vary in those kinds of ways. That would be really interesting. I haven't tried it. Okay. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time.